Again, sir. Ah, yes. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I think it's time. Time. Time, yes. Yep. Uh, so we're going to talk today about uh, the state of our infrastructure. Can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. Yes. And can you see this tiny print? Mostly? Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, my name is Kevin Finzi. And Pierre, <laughs> uh, we're going to uh, talk about the state of Fedora infrastructure. And we're going to go over a bunch of things that we've done in the previous year since the last flock. Uh, at least those highlights of things that we uh, remembered and thought were important and people may not have realized. Uh, we're bound to leave things out. There are just so many things that happen. We are bound to have forgotten something or uh, come up with some. Uh, some items that, uh, or not come up with some items that you, you will definitely know of. Uh, so if you want to chime in with something, if we're talking about a particular application or whatnot, and you remember something that happened, please uh, chime right in. If you have questions uh, while we're going, feel free to chime right in. Um, let's see, anything else? There might be things that you have already oh. heard about this morning. Yes, there might be uh, other talks. We're gonna we're gonna point to a number of other talks, uh, specific things that that we worked on this last year and people are presenting on at this very conference. That you may want to go to those talks if you're more interested in that uh, particular subject. Uh, so let's see. Let's go ahead and get right into it. Does that work? Yes. Hey. So uh, here is a, an item. Uh, how many of you knew that we had a OpenStack cloud? Not a fair number of people. Yep. <laughs> Good. Uh, so we've done a bunch of work on the uh, the cloud this last year. Uh, just recently, we've added some PowerPC 64 compute nodes, and Coper's going to start using those very soon, and that'll be nice. That'll uh, uh, prevent uh, any issues with those uh, PowerPC 64 builds, and they should be a good deal faster. I hope. Um, we've added storage. There was a lot of storage added last year. Uh, and there's a lot of things going on in Coper. Uh, you can find the Coper guys wearing shirts that say, ask about Coper. <laughs> um, so that uses our, uh, our private cloud uh, to do all of its builds and so forth. Uh, so a lot of things going on there. Uh, we have a Jenkins instance uh, that is getting more and more projects in it. Uh, that, does uh, its builds also in, in the OpenStack cloud. And also kind of as, as a note, we have been transitioning uh, our, our cloud stuff to fedorainfracloud.org as a separate domain. Uh, we initially had things set up as cloud.fedoraproject.org, but that presented certain problems, like uh, you couldn't do uh, HSTS headers on all Fedora project if you had some cloud instances running without certificates and that sort of thing. So we kind of moved it off to its own domain uh, to, uh, to get around that problem. So let's see, I think there's probably some other stuff there, but uh, the Ansible move. Since the last vlog, we were talking about moving our stuff to Ansible, and we completed that. Uh, so now we're running all Ansible for our configuration management stuff. Uh, we've been helping test upstream Ansible releases, which has been really good. The last couple releases, I've been testing all their release candidates and finding issues, and then they fix the issues before the actual release, which is, which is great. Uh, the Ansible folks have been really responsive to, to bug reports and whatnot. Uh, good stuff. Um, we've also been working on cleaning up our Ansible uh, playbooks and trying to make sure that they're item potent, so you run them 20 times and you get the exact same, no changes after the initial uh, setup. Uh, we will have a workshop on uh, Friday, I think it is. I'm not exactly sure off the schedule, but I, or uh, Thursday, I think it is. Yeah. We have a, uh, an Ansible workshop where we're going to work on, we, we kind of set up our Ansible infrastructure when Ansible was first created many years ago. So and we've been trying to keep up with things, but there are some kind of standards that we haven't done, and we haven't kind of moved to the same structure that, that people expect these days. So we're going to have a workshop on Thursday and try and uh, work on that. Uh, because our we have a lot of Ansible playbooks. We, we're a good example project for other people to look at. All our stuff is open. 
and we'd like that to be very standard compliant and you know sort of uh, set up correctly uh, for people to look at. Uh, it says Friday morning, but I don't know if that's correct. To check it. Uh, this, over this last year, we moved most of our uh, sort of standard infrastructure type stuff to RHEL 7. Um, we have a breakdown here of, of what our uh, OS releases are. Uh, the astute among you will notice that we have Fedora 22 listed here, which recently went end of life. Uh, so there's some instances there that we still need to clean up. Uh, not too many, but uh, just a few. There's uh, Jink some Jenkins instances. There's some build instances in our uh, our private cloud that various people have been using that we need to have them transition to newer versions, etc. Is that due to incompatibility or just time? Just time. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, like for example, we provide in our cloud uh, build systems for uh, the Twisted Python folks, mm -hmm. so they can run Twisted tests on really? Fedora 22, 23, 24, oh. etc. So I've set them up with uh, Fedora 24 instances, and they've turned those on, but they haven't turned off the builds on the 22 instances yet, so they can disable them. So, so on the Fedora nodes, there are only time constraints. On the real 6, we have right. both times and compatibility. Yes. And that's why we still have 26 uh, real 6 instances. Right. Uh, and that's a good deal less urgent, because obviously RHEL is uh, supported for, RHEL 6 is going to be supported for quite a bit longer. So. But we'd like to move those yeah. <laughs> along. And there'll be more about that in some later slides. Uh, when I put these together, I looked, there was 525 uh, instances we had in Ansible, Ansible Manage. That isn't all the instances, though, because a lot of the cloud ones are just done ad hoc by people um, and things like that. So we have quite a few instances uh, out there. Uh, some of them are spread out quite a bit, uh, like our proxy servers are spread out all over the world. And so some parts of uh, our Ansible infrastructure are pretty quick. Like, you know, you can configure something over 10 hosts, and if they're all in the same data center, everything's great. But if you're going across our proxy servers, which are in eight data centers all over the world, that takes a long time. Some of them are slower from the management host, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, also, um, we've moved. The move to Bodhi 2 and HyperKitty Mailman 3 allowed us to get rid of some of the uh, RHEL 6 instances and move them to 7 or Fedora uh, over the past year. Awesome. Uh, another thing we've done since the last flock uh, is here and here. I don't think he is. Um, so we brought the secondary architectures into our main infrastructure. In the past, uh, the ARM, PowerPC, and S390 Kojis and their build systems, the secondary architectures, were all just sort of done by those people who worked on those. And as you might imagine, they didn't have a whole lot of time to you know, apply updates regularly or configure things in the same way that the primary was configured or move to RHEL 7 quickly, et cetera, et cetera. So we moved all those into our Ansible management uh, infrastructure. So now they are managed exactly the same way the primary code is managed. They use the same Ansible templates, so we know that they're actually set up the same way. The same OSs, they follow the same update patterns we do, all that stuff. So that has been really nice. Uh, we've run into problems in the past with that where we have a, an update on a primary uh, Koji and it doesn't filter out to them and then they have problems building because they need to do a Koji package, etc., etc. Um, so that, that's been a really good one. So uh, looking forward from the system inside of things, uh, this is uh, a, a slide for Patrick here since he works on our uh, private cloud. But uh, we have a lot of cloud plans over the next uh, year or so or two. Uh, we want to move update to the latest uh, Red Hat OpenStack platform. Right now we're running five, which is pretty old. And we'd like to move to uh, eight or nine, whichever is eight now, but nine. Is that a, is, that's a huge amount of work, right? It is, but I don't, it's, I don't know how compatible those releases are. They, they aren't yeah. very. So basically what it will entail is spinning up a new cloud on the new version with a few compute nodes and then migrating everything over to it 
and adding the compute nodes as you as you migrate. So it's a lot of work, but I think it'll be it'll be worth it. And once we're at that level, the later OpenStack does support upgrades and things like that. So, but would, does somebody document what happens when that besides in a Git log and Ansible does that actually get written down anywhere? As far as what? Well, well because this is a useful bit of documentation for anybody else who ever has to do the same thing later. Sure. And so I don't know. Because I looked at this stuff. I looked at the Ansible playbooks and stuff just to see how I might do stuff in my own setups. And so, right. You know. Yeah, so the question was about the, the uh, private clouds and upgrading and setting up. Right now, our current hacked up OpenStack uh, 5 is it, as an Ansible playbook it was installed with, but that was three years ago? Mm -hmm. Something like that. And Things have changed a lot. There's a lot of different, the installer is different, configuration is different. So basically, once we move to the new setup, it's going to be a different playbook. It's going to be a whole new setup. But it should be in there, definitely. Uh, so that's what we want to do. We want to add uh, some ARP64 and ARMv7 instances, uh, either via uh, vert on uh, ARM, mm -hmm. on ARP64, or via Ironic which is the install, treat a real machine as a, a cloud instance type of thing. Uh, we want to get uh, Ypsilon authentication, and we want to open up, uh, we want to set up things so that more people can use our OpenStack, essentially, for things that are useful for Fedora. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about at the uh, infrastructure workshop uh, tomorrow is laying out how we want to set that up. But basically, it should be fairly easy for us to provide authentication and some amount of resources to any contributor so that they can log into the OpenStack and spin up an instance and test something and do you know whatever it is they need to do uh, easily. Now, we're going to have to figure out what resources we can provide to everybody and what makes sense for people to run there, if we want people to run long-term long things, how we want to secure that. You know, all these questions uh, remain to be solved, but I think that could be something that's very useful for folks in the coming years. Uh, and then there's work on uh, setting up an OpenShift <coughs> instance on top of our private cloud, again, for contributors to be able to spin up applications and test things. Uh, the cloud working group uh, folks are working on that. Uh, another thing we want to try and do over the next year is move the stuff that is on fedorahosted.org, which is kind of our old uh, source project uh, repository. And we want to try and move those things to Begir. Um, it's going to be a lot of work, and there's going to be things that we have to change, and there's going to be things that don't want to move, and there's going to be things that want to move somewhere else, and all, all sorts of stuff like that. We want to give a long ramp here. We don't want to just say, oh, we're turning off Fedora Hosted tomorrow. Get your stuff moved. No. We want to, we want to give everyone the opportunity to move, migrate stuff. Um, and we're hoping that we can get, in the last couple of months, I've been trying to talk to the larger projects on Fedora Hosted and get them to file issues in Pagir for things they need or workflow they need. Uh, and with mixed success, you know, yeah. they've <laughs> provided some mixed. stuff. Um, we do have an a, uh, importer now, or exporter, or whatever. No. Yes. <laughs> and the author is here. And hopefully attachments are working. Yeah. They are? Oh, cool. Oh, ah, very good. Oh, that, that's so good. we now have an importer that will take a track project, all the issues from it, and move them over to Pagare issues, uh, so you don't lose any history that way. And of course, Git repos are easy to move. Uh, but some people have particular workflows in their track projects or uh, or whatnot. So if you have a Fedora hosted project and you have an issue moving to Begir or there's some problem or workflow, please do file an issue on Begir and we'll see what we can do. There is a question about the project, the few projects that are not using Git. There are a few projects. Fedora hosted supported uh, Mercurial, SVN, SVN and, and Bazaar. And Bazaar, right. <laughs> All those are convertible to Git. Yes. 
<laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> and there's a couple of folks I talked to that are, were looking to move to GitHub or somewhere else just because the rest of their projects are there or you know their contributor base is there or Network effect. whatever. Yes. And you know, that's certainly valid. Yeah. Does the main page is ready for Pager has been released for six, seven months now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's really usable right. to anyone. What I mean is, Crack is uh, very easy to use for end users, repeaters, and for the translation team. And uh, Pages is, is more like a uh, uh, hit, but it's more, more technical. There's less documentation on stuff, how to use it. So it's just about communication, yeah. how do we do things in Pager and stuff. I think there's some of that, but I think it's also improved a lot in the in the last few months. Uh, there's a documentation. Your Pagera project can have documentation now. It's another docs repo, which will render, so you can actually describe you know what you want users to do, how you want them to file issues. There's templates for issues now. Uh, so I think there's a lot of a lot of that is there now, um, but you know again. User interface is, is difficult, <laughs> so yeah. I mean we're always looking to improve it. Track, some people like track and and think it's great, but other people despise it. So I mean it's just yeah. There's a what well, you do the best you can. Well, you can't support it forever. And I think we're behind. Our track is pretty behind. It well, it's, it's on a supported branch, but. It is, and again, Track is a project. They were supposed to have their 1.2 release out uh, three, four months ago, something like that, and it, it just isn't released. So, I don't know. Yeah. If you have comments or ideas on how to improve Tracks, then there's the, the buggy, I mean, there's definitely room for improvement and room for how much, ideas or complaints, so feel free to How much work is there available to do things in Pagura? That makes no sense. How many developers of Pugger are there right now that are? Uh, well, interestingly, Pugger is actually one of the most successful projects that we are running I in the infrastructure from an application I point of view disagree. and from contributor point of view. It's, well, I'm far beyond on the number of commits uh, compared to the, to the other people, but it's one of the projects that is attracting the most newcomers to yes. the project. And the person behind you is a perfect example. <laughs> he's, new, he's new to the community, he's new to Fedora for a few months, and yes, we turn the Pagger importer, and yes, a few patches in Pagger itself. I have stuff I want to do too. I'm just my my question is, if you file issues that you have with Pagger that prevent you from moving from track, what chance do you have of having them fixed? Really, I mean, we we try to get the ticket list below okay. the hundred. It's because people, we, we people are, are going to ask that question. <laughs> so right, I mean, we can only do the best we can do. Of but course. Yeah, it's, it's it's hard to say. Uh, it would be good. The things that we need to do the post and move, I think we're going to set up a label, yeah. and so we can at least know what those issues are and maybe prior prioritize them as best we can with the developers we have. So. Uh, ah, yes, containers. So uh, we've been talking about uh, moving into the container world now that things are uh, uh, sort of a little more stable and a little more. Uh, useful now that we have a container uh, build system, uh, which uh, Adam was talking about earlier this morning. Um, I'm looking at maybe uh, setting up a mirror list container. Uh, I think that might be a good win for us. Uh, but we're going to have to figure out exactly how to do that and how, you know, what part of it is going to be in the container and what part of it is going to be outside the container. Mirror lists is our application uh, that returns a list of mirrors to users. So if you do DNF update, blah, 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 you're querying a mirror list server and it's giving you back this meta link of uh, <coughs> servers and checksums and so forth. And so it's a very critical app. It's something that we want to have running all the time. We don't want to disrupt it, etc. It's, it's one of the few applications that basically don't need NetJS. It, yeah, because people mm -hmm. are reporting issues before not just right. If there's ever a problem in it, we hear from mm -hmm. users before our our monitor even <laughs> goes off. You know, something happens and some user shows up. Hey, I can't, I can't do DNF update. Uh, so it's obviously very critical, but it's also something that's very isolated. It takes a mirror list, which is this blob of data, and it just serves that data out. That's all it does. So it's a good candidate for a container. 
So we're looking at maybe setting that up, leveraging the container build system. And uh, also if we do this, I mean, it's gonna have other advantages like if you, for whatever reason, were operating in an isolated environment um, and you, or you had a particular environment and you needed to do your own mirrorless server, it would be very easy to just take this container, give it your own data, and then get your own you know, metal links or whatever back. So uh, we're gonna talk about this in the uh, infrastructure workshop also, how, how we're gonna do it. Uh, we've been talking for a number of years about getting on the database replication uh, train. Uh, we just need to buckle down and do it. I've been working on it some this year. Uh, right now, our database, we have a number of database servers and you know we back them up and uh, whatnot, but they're not highly available. So that's why you see us do outages periodically where we have to update things. If the database server gets rebooted, then there's that outage while it's down. We want to move that to high availability type setup where we don't have to have those outages. We can just fail over, reboot, etc. Um, there's a, a proposal out there. Uh, it's not had wide uh, discussion yet. It was brought up to Fesco though. Uh, moving the secondary architectures. Right now, the secondary architectures are their own Kojis. So S390 is its own Koji. Uh, AR64, PowerPC, there's a proposal to just move all those builds into the primary Koji so that they just all happen at the same time. And that would simplify a lot of stuff uh, for release engineering and it really wouldn't have that much impact on people because right now if you do a build on the primary and it fails on PowerPC or something like that, then there's a bug, somebody has to look into it, somebody has to fix it, somebody has to submit a new build. So that would just make this process quicker and easier for everybody. Uh, it's gonna be discussed more probably in the next few weeks. And uh, if we do that, AR64 would probably be the first one to move in. So, so what would it mean like, if, if the secondary, actually the build would fail? It would mean that the build would fail, so that you would, you would say, okay, my build failed, and either, either it would be something obvious that you could just fix, or you would go, what? Why is that failing on you know, S390? And you would talk to the secondary art folks and say, why is this failing on S390? And they say, oh, here's a patch. But would it be like a, the whole build is failed? Or yes. Well, it depends. There's mm -hmm. some talk about that, whether right now the way it would work is the whole build would fail, but there's some talk about changing Koji so that it doesn't do that. So that it, it would still fail the build, but it would continue doing all the, right now, if any architecture fails, Koji goes, ah, oh, it's failed, it cancels the other builds, and uh, there's talk about making it fail the build still, but continue all the builds till their completion, so that you would know exactly which architectures it actually failed on, instead of just one. But, you had a question? Could I opt out? Um, <laughs> <laughs> even now, Sometimes I'm building packages that take hours. Now I wait for so, ARM to days. So all of the secondary architectures are faster than our primary ARM v7 architecture. So it shouldn't be a problem. Well, it should. It should increase any of the speed. However, also in that vein, we should be making ARM v7 builds a lot faster soon. Where we have an ARM64 uh, set of hardware that can run ARM v7 VMs on it. So we're gonna move those builders to VMs on ARP64, and they should be, I think it's three to four to five times faster. So that should speed it, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's looking for that. So that should happen very, relatively soon, but that's the slowest. Uh, PowerPC S390 and ARP64 are all faster than RP7. So I, it should, once we land that, it should speed up everything. I don't think, that speed is, I have some critical issue and then some architecture I don't know nothing about right. is blocking me from pushing the critical update Fedora and nobody from the architecture team is available for help. Should I exclude the R just to like that's it happen That's or? a perfectly valid question. That's what we'd have to discuss. I and mean, this is supposed to be brought up on the developers for discussion. So yeah, maybe there should be a procedure like that. So like if it's a security update and you have to get it out quickly and you know S390 doesn't build or whatever, 
maybe that is a valid thing to do, exclude Argent, do that build, and then revert it so that they can fix it and push out another build, but all the regular other architectures can actually you know, be updated. So, so yeah. this is, uh, uh, there's a lot about uh, shifting work from, uh, from secondary arches thing, uh, to um, primary maintainers of these packages. Well, it's not so actually so shifting that. If some build fails, yeah. uh, Packager needs to look into it in order to fix uh, their build. And so there's uh, some statistic on this, and, and again, well, I don't have all the data here, but there's a statistic on this that's like 99% of packages in primary build fine on secondary. Yeah. Just there's no issue. And when it is an issue, it's either something that the secondary person has to come up with a patch for, or you know, do something. Mm -hmm. Uh, invasive, you know, something, some work. Uh, so, in the vast majority of cases, it doesn't matter. It's yes, just uh, really. My question is uh, wouldn't we need um, extra resources for packagers like, uh, uh, like uh, the ARM machines we have in cloud where people could test with packages? Yeah, theoretically, we have that, but. Yep. So, we have that for ARM, but not, not for, for secondary artists. Right, and we, yeah, that's a good, perfectly valid question. I, I agree that having those resources would be good. We could do PPC now in the cloud because we have a compute node there, but we still need S390 and ARP64, but. I think, I think the largest problem that you get in this situation is you're trying to build a no-arch package. It picks a random architecture that simply does not support OCaml right. or some Java or something. Right. Right. Right, you're not really no arch, but you are because now you add a new package, you have to know right. which arches to exclude. And of course, then we break no arch, which is not something we really want to do. Yeah, it's been a long, long term yeah. problem. I yeah. don't know what the good answer is for that. Uh, so. well, anyway, there's yeah. going to be a lot more discussion on this on the list, and, and Peter has a big proposal <laughs> and so forth. How oh, good. All right. What else have we got? Oh, uh, monitoring automation we're working on this year. Uh, Spooge is going to work on, right now we use Nagios just because it sucks the least. Um, there's certainly lots of other options out there now. Uh, but right now our, our Nagios system is very manual. So like when we create a new application or instance or whatever, it depends on whoever is adding that to make sure that they monitor all the right things and add the hosts and so forth. Uh, since we now have Ansible, there, there's no reason to do this manually anymore. This should be completely automated. When you add a new host in Ansible to do something, it should get monitored. So uh, hopefully this year we'll, we'll have that. It'll be good. And then I think we're on to the application stuff. Yeah. Uh, so on the application side, as Kevin said, we have had a, quite a number of changes uh, this year. And we basically cannot really list them all here because there are just too many, uh, too many applications, too many changes. So what we try to do here is uh, to highlight some of these that are big enough, some of these that, are, that we consider to be important enough, and some that you might not have heard about. So these are applications that we have developed or changed, reworked, uh, that are important changes. We missed the FMN ones. Mm -hmm. We missed the FMN uh, oh, right. there. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, important changes, but that you might not have heard about. Uh, so, one that one is probably something that uh, a good counterexample to what I just said, because that's probably something that you already know and have heard about. Uh, so, Melman three, Melman has released a new major release uh, that was long overdue, which is Melman three, and we are moving away from the old uh, uh, Piper Mail uh, archive interface where emails were listed by months and if you had a thread going over two months, then you had to go from one page to the other to actually be able to read the entire thread to something a little bit more, I'm going to say web 2.0, <laughs> uh, where you actually get one thread entirely, you can reply online directly. So, and that's basically uh, HyperKitty. So HyperKitty is developed by uh, Aurelien, who is here in the room. Um, and the idea, one of the idea of it is to be able to bridge forums with mailing lists. So you, ca you can interact with a mailing list as if you were just looking at the forum and you can one of the key feature which I see in there is that you can actually go to HyperKitty, send an email to a mailing list that you are not subscribed to 
you won't get any emails and you're still able to actually send your emails, get the reply, reply to this thread and you don't have to follow any, any of the other message communication that's going on the list and you're not going to receive any of the emails that's going on the list, but you still get your message through and you still can access the replies. I think that was one of the, one of the key features of it. The advantage is that nowadays we are complete, the migration has been completed, so there is no more main main tube running. Uh, well, there is one on Federal Estate. Nope, they, they moved into... Okay, so no, even Federal Estate is now main main three and uh, HyperKitty based. Uh, there is a talk about that, so if you want to learn more about uh, HyperKitty... Uh, it's at 4.30 this afternoon. Voilà, 4 30 this afternoon uh, with Aurelia. Time to play me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sure. Question is out. Can you subscribe to a mailing list that is private since you cannot see the mailing list since it is private? Yeah, so there are two web interfaces for mailman. I don't see the out of guiding chain, and there is a web interface for administration called Postorius, and you may not have to see the link to that thing. Um, it's, um, I can't remember the graphic, it's slash so main, it's then slash of archives, and there you have the way to, you have a way to uh, subscribe to list and administrate the list. So, so the answer for the for the movie here, uh, you can subscribe. To, so there are two interface to main main three. One is the archive, and that's HyperKitty, and one is the admin, and that's Postorius. Uh, you cannot do that in, via HyperKitty because that's the archive and the archive are private. But you can do that via Postorius. So another small application that we wrote is called MD API, and MD API is a very simple application. The idea is. Uh, we, have YUM, we have the YUM repositories, and the YUM repositories are consisted either of XML file or small SQLI database. And that's when you DNF update, you see uh, a download at the beginning, and basically it's, fetch it's fetching these files. And, but if you want to actually you know, get the information from these files, you either need to use the DNF API and then download and cache the information locally, and then when there is a new role of update, you need to retrieve this information. Or you can use MD API, and the idea of it is it's basically it's a very small API that just exports what is present on the SQLI database from the YUM repositories. So it goes. You can ask for uh, what are the dependencies of a package. You can ask what is the change log of a package. You can ask what are the files present mm -hmm. in a package. You can ask version release. You can ask uh, the set packages. Uh, you can you can use the set package to go back to the the source package. Uh, this kind of thing. So all this kind of meta information that are present on the YUM repository, which you may want to have access to, and is that public or within infrastructure. All this is public? this is public, oh, yep. and this is using the federal the the Rawhide uh, federal twenty four. We, we might need to configure uh, federal twenty three federal twenty two. It's using the testing repository. It's using the stable repositories and the release repositories. So if you ask for information about the kernel, it's going to look for update testing. If it doesn't find it in update testing, it's going to look at updates. If it doesn't find it in updates, it's going to look at release. So eventually, you should get an answer. It might take a little bit for longer, but it's actually very, very fast. So it's, uh, you don't notice that it's actually going through three database to give you the answer. But you get everything there. And it returns to a nice JSON blob, so you can integrate that with, uh, with your application and play around with it. Are there any plans to use uh, latest repos from Fuzzy sometimes? Sorry? Are there any plans to use the latest repos from So the Koji repo is in there as well. Yep, oh, it is nice. So you can, uh, so yeah. when you go on the, so it's, it's I didn't put the URL here, it's on apps.fedoraproject.org slash mdapi. If you go in there, you have a nice ASCII page mm -hmm. with a few links. And one of them is the branches link, and the branches basically mm -hmm. list the different repos that are available. or. Uh, branches, so it will say Koji, it will say Rohide, it would say Ferro 24, 23, 22, okay. EPL 7, EPL 6, nice. EPL 5. What, one other thing to note here is that it also emits fed messages. So it'll say MD API noticed Koji build no, da yeah, database updated, and then you can see that it updated, or Fedora 25 updates updated, or whatever. 
questions? Is there a repo query yeah. that we can use that will use this idea? Uh, so the question is, is there a repo query equivalent that uses that? Uh, it's something which I have in my mind for a little <laughs> bit of time, but uh, I still haven't played with it. Because I really would like to yeah, get the iterative uh, aspects of uh, repo query, building the dependency trees and this kind of thing using in the API. It's probably pretty fun to write. Uh, so the answer is no, still, uh, <laughs> still open in the open if someone wants to pick it up, but otherwise I might just get around to it at one point. <laughs> so and the good part about it is that we actually started dogfooding it. Uh, so Fedora Packages is what's running at apps.fedoraproject.org slash packages, and it's this application that we have, which is not really meant for contributors, although it is used for contributors, but it's also used for people outside the Fedora community to see which packages are in Fedora, which version are they, uh, what are the contact people, what are the bug reports, what are the, the patches, because it also lists the content of the Git repo, uh, the changelog, these kind of things. And it was getting fairly slow. The architecture was a little bit uh, weak. Uh, one of the problems that it had was it was actually using the SQLite database from Yum. And it had the lock so that it would update the database, and then the lock would not be released, and then the front end would be blocked by this lock. And, uh, or the front end would lock the database, and then the back end would not be able to update the old stuff. So it was a little bit of a mess uh, playing with that. Uh, so we get rid of all the Yum integration parts, and we just use MD API nowadays. And it uses it cache the information from MD API, so it's very snappy, and it ref and it uh, refresh its cache or it invalidates its cache when MD API sends a fail message message saying that I updated. Uh, there was a new Koji repo build. Uh, that has, so MD API is not only able to say, well, there is a new Koji repo build. It also says what changed in that repo build, so which are the package that were inf impacting by this uh, update. And so it, and, uh, Fedora packages just look at these messages and see what, there was a new kernel, so I'm just invalidate the cache for the kernel. And when someone goes to the page and asks for the kernel, it's going to create in the API, retrieve the info, cache them, so that when the next person is coming, they will eat the cache directly. It's much more stable than it used to. We have had much less tickets open about, uh, uh, about project being outdated. Uh, there is still a little bit of uh, sometime small issues. Uh, one of them is coming from the, the Ruby world, uh, where we have one package that's present from two different sources. And basically, according to who is looking at which page first, the information is going to be displayed uh, in one way or the other way. But it's, uh, it's a little bit of a corner case. And there is no real good. Uh, answer for that one because it's, uh, it's a tricky one. <laughs> and so yeah, it's, it's fast message based. I it, use that every day. So. It's, it's pretty handy. Yeah. Uh, we do get bugs on it, actually, quite regularly. But most often, because people think that this is our bugzilla, so they just report packaging issues on that. <laughs> so we actually have a template in there saying, like, thank you for your ticket, but this is not the right place. Please fill it to bugzilla.reda.com. <laughs> OK. Uh, I'm going to go a bit faster now. Yeah. Uh, Mot, uh, Mot is something which I wanted to bring forward, mostly uh, because it's pretty cool. I mean, this is the, the new interface for the mi meeting logs. So when you do a meetings on RSC, you use Zotbot and you start meeting and end meetings. Uh, the logs, there is HTML and text logs that are published. Uh, Mot retrieves them, stores them, presents them in a nice way. It's using JavaScript, so that's one of our few applications that's mostly only JavaScript, I think. And one of the cool thing about it is uh, it has absolutely nothing to do with the Fedora engineering team. It was m made by uh, someone from the community that came up with us and was like, yeah, I'm making this cool app for this. And we were like, OK, go for it. And we just run it. And he wrote it. He's maintaining it. And we're just running it and pointing him for the bugs. So it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, Mirror Manager 2, uh, so that's something which you don't, which you're all using, but you don't see uh, pretty much. Uh, it was an old application that's back in the days from when Fedora Core melted on one of yeah. the router uh, on a release day in the Red Hat data center, and Red Hat not being so happy about hardware failure. Uh, so we started to run mirrors, and there was how do we di direct people to these mirrors? So that's Mirror Manager. So it's something from Fedora Core. Four of three. Mm. It was really an old application, so it needed to be refreshed. That's Mirror Manager 2. Um, 
it's in it's live. If you haven't seen it, it's working, so that's good. Uh, the good thing about it is uh, we brought back a couple of features that had been removed over time. One of them is the distribution of the mirrors over the world. So you have a map of the world and you can see where the mirrors are. Uh, we have also a few stats which are integrated in it. Uh, one of them is this one. So this is all the work of uh, Adrian Reber, who is a Red Hatter, but it's not, has nothing to do with the Fedora infrastructure. It just runs, he also likes Mirror Manager, he runs the mirror, so he's just uh, working on it. And so this is an idea of uh, how many mirrors are, th so this is for Rawhide, uh, x x 64 and uh, everything repo. This is the number of, in green, you have the number of uh, mirrors that is up to date when the cron job run. So what you can see is uh, well, we probably here at the row update. So we have 20 mirrors that are up to date. And then at the next run, we have 50, 70, 78, 85. And then we have a new update. Is that every, oh, it's every four hours? Yeah, yeah, something like that, yeah. yeah. And what we see at the top is we have some mirrors that are, never, that are always outdated. So the question becomes, of course, is that always the same mirrors? So do we have always about 10 mirrors at the top that are just always outdated? And since they're always outdated, people don't use them because mirror list is not going to give you a mirror that's outdated. So the, the, the next thing that we should do is look at these 10 mirrors and see if they are constants over time. But it, get, it does give us an idea of how long it takes for, when we push an, a, an update to ride, how long it takes to reach all of our mirrors. And you can see that it, it does take about so two hours. Uh, that's 14. No, 14 that's, to that's so. yeah, that's four hours. Yeah. So in eight hours, we have most of our yeah. mirrors updated. So we are working on. It yeah, to tips make here that is like ten minutes, but sure. Uh, what's the relation between mirror manager and mirror list app? So Mirror Manager uh, is the application that people running mirrors are going to interact with. That's the place where they declare the mirrors. And mirror lists is what uh, is using the data from mirror manager. So there is there is there are three components. There is a front end mirror manager where people registered. There is the back end that takes the, the information from mirror manager, crawl them, see if they're updated, generates a data files that is then given to the mirror list to be served to the users. So that's uh, the, the triangle that's being built here. Uh, then we have Basset. So Basset is you. Not you haven't heard about the name, but you have heard about the issue, and that's spamming. And so release the hand, and we have Basset to fight spamming. Uh, that's uh, Patrick's uh, baby. The idea is uh, when you register too fast, uh, it goes through a machine learning uh, process that tries to figure out if you're a spammer or not based on the information that we have. And then you sign the CLA, and then it has more information, and then you start doing something, and then it blocks you because you behave badly. Uh, there is going to be a talk about that, so if you want to know a little bit more of the gory details, uh, please attend. Uh, then there is Pegger. Uh, well, that's my baby. Uh, so it's already been mentioned. It's uh, our new Forge. Uh, only pa it's Python based. Mm -hmm. uh, it got a very, very big uh, lift face. Yeah, face lift huge. by uh, Ryan here. So all the credits go to him if you like the new UI. If you don't like the, new, the old one, it's me. <laughs> Uh, that has been a that has been a tremendous help to get the project started. I think also yeah. because it's it makes the project much more attractive and also to new contributors. Uh, there was one project that we had put a slide off and that somehow got removed. Oh, right. uh, is we also started reworking our uh, FMN system. So FMN is the Fedora the Fedora message notification service. Uh, so it's the place where you can go. It's on apps that Fedora project that are slash notifications. And it's the place where you can go and exactly point out which kind of notification you want to get from our infrastructure. So, and you can not only say which notification, but you can say where. And so the idea is like, you can get, uh, I want to have an IRC, an IRC notification when I do a build on Koji that is successful, and I want to get it by email when the build is failed. And then, because then I can archive the emails, I can go back to the links and see what went wrong. So these are the kind of the, the, level, the granularity that FMN is allowing us. And we did an entire, an entire rewrite of the backend. We just changed the, the way the, the architecture of the backend worked. And we're about three times, about three times faster. Uh, we can proceed about, proceed about 100 messages per minute. Uh, we were about uh, 30 messages per minute before, something like that. And we 
deployed that last week, Monday, yeah. and on Tuesday we had the mass branching, mm -hmm. and I think we recovered from the mass branching in about half a day, while it took us about two days before. What's the, what's the bottleneck here? The bottleneck here is uh, computing. For each message that goes on the bus, we need to compute all the filters of all the rules of every user in the database to figure out if they want to use, if they want oh, wow. to be notified of this message and where. So that could be done in parallel. Actually. So it's yeah. parallelized uh, to some extent. Uh, so yeah, we now have uh, using a queuing system and then different workers that are doing the computation and then one worker at the, at the bank that's t just doing the IO sending to IRC and emails. Uh, some message topics used to be ignored by a command, I'm assuming due to performance reasons. So, would it be possible to enable that now? Uh, some, if there is, there is, if there is a need for it, definitely. So, there are two copper's repo that are uh, blacklisted right now. It's that's the RubyGem and the PyPy repo <laughs> that are entirely rebuilding the entire RubyGem ecosystem and the entire PyPy ecosystem. Uh, this is from before the the rewrite. Uh, we kept the, the change in there. Uh, I'm actually curious to remove that and see how Swamp yeah. FMN gets or not. Uh, I, I'd be interested in uh, receiving some notifications about deals uh, being tagged in a Okay. Right, that was another one. Uh, so that's, that's maybe something we can look into. Yeah. The, the the only thing why we when we deployed the new FMN we did not uh, clear out the, the blacklisted re copper repo uh, was about I'm not sure if there is actually anyone that's really interesting to get notification about every single build in in copper of PyPy or RubyGem. If there is, I'm happy to turn them back on. But if there is no one on the receiving end, I don't see why we should just put load on the system for the fun of it. It's not running on my machine. I don't I don't need ether at home, and it's already run. Off. Long time ago, yeah. there was a promise for Android app notifications. <laughs> 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 Is there something that will give me push notifications from this to my cell phone? Uh-oh. <laughs> 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 We're looking at Ricky. Uh, very different than me. Work in progress. Work in progress. Was that wrong? <laughs> so, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> the source code is there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the ch one of the changes that's coming is uh, we're actually adding a new backend and that's going to be a, a server sent event backend, so an event source server oh. that is going to be able to send notifications. So you the idea is to integrate that in hubs. In hubs, you're going to have a feed, so it's a live refresh of notification, and you're going to be able to say on your hubs, well, I want to be notified on email, on IRC, or on my hubs page about these and these subjects, and the the, SS, the event source server could be used for other kind of notifications, including the, the GNOME desktop uh, notification mm -hmm. that plugin that worked or used to work. So one of the ideas here is that we really keep the, all the computation of who wants to know about what in one place, and instead of trying to spread that uh, over different uh, applications. I'm completely running out of time because I still have the coming soon part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to go very quickly in there. Epsilon is getting a new, pretty awesome uh, feature, which is the OpenID Connect support. And that's, again, Patrick's uh, work. He's part of the OpenID committee. What's the name again? OpenID Foundation. The OpenID Foundation is the Red Hat representative of the OpenID Foundation. <laughs> so you, he signs autograph at the end of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things, so. OpenID Connect is basically OS2 on steroids, uh, fixing one of the search problems of OS2. It will allow us to do cross-app authentication. So things like when, you, when you're on up, you will be able to interact with Fedocal without actually going to Fedocal. Or when you're on body or some new interface, you would be able to interact with PackageDB or body uh, in one place. Uh, and that should also work much, our life much easier for every CLI uh, programs that we want to work with. Uh, Fast3 is going to be released, uh, and I see two people here just, that are just really, really hard working on it right now. Uh, we basically should have it running on staging by the end of the week, pretty much. Uh, after that, we're going to break staging, and then we're going to fix staging, and then we're going to break prod, and hopefully fix prod. Uh, I'm let you go through the, the support, the, the changes here. Uh, one of the things is uh, it's also going to help us with uh, everything that's token-based authentication, so every CLI tool should benefit from that as well. Oh, nice. 
Uh, PackageDB, that's something that has been mentioned. Uh, we have added namespacing to PackageDB so that it supports uh, other uh, components than RPMs. Uh, Docker is, has been mentioned uh, with uh, Max, uh, Adam, Maximilian and Adam Miller's talk uh, earlier. Uh, there is also interest in the modularity group uh, to interact with PackageDB, but there might be a PackageDB3 around the corner for that. Fedora Hubs, uh, so the idea is to make it easier for new contributors to find what's going on our, in our community and how to reach us. Apparently, uh, our old timers do like our small dark corners, uh, so we want to put some uh, way for newcomers to join us in the dark side. Uh, there is going to be a Hackfest on Friday on it, so feel free to join. Uh, Pagger has also new things coming up, private repos, uh, so I'm not quite sure yet if we want to uh, allow it on Pagger.io, but if you want to run your own Pagger instance, or if your company wants to run it, then you should be able to activate private repo versus public repo. Uh, we are working to be able to mirror code, so when you push to, to when you push to Pagger, it will be able to mirror uh, to GitHub, for example, or to Federality. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have Pagger Importer, uh, which allows us to bring your project from, say, GitHub or Federality to Pagger itself. Um, and something that has been asked and that we need to figure out uh, is uh, to get mailing lists for projects. So that's uh, with Mailman, it should be much easier to do, uh, and that's just something which we need to get around. Uh, package.fedoraproject.org. Uh, so far, it's uh, a nice Seagate interface, and you can browse the repository, you can access the, the, the Lucaside cache. And nowadays, in staging, you can do slash pagger, and you can fork, and you can see which project you're managing, you can see the content of the Git repo, you can fork, you can pull request, and eventually you <laughs> will be able to merge. <laughs> The, the thing with it is uh, you can fork, you can pull request, you cannot do tickets. This does not replace Bugzilla. Uh, this does not replace PackageDB. So every SCL, all the group management, all the user management remains in PackageDB and is synced to Pagger when we sync the gates and everything. And it does provide hooks. So things like webhooks are actually provided by Pagger and we, well, it's not deployed yet on staging, but that's something which we will want to deploy at At one point, it has git hook, so you should be able to get commit yeah, by emails. Don't try the URL right now. It should? Just don't. It should work. You're on it. Oh, okay. It's working. Again, go ahead. Maybe do something like reject the commit if it says RPM link or something like that. We could. Uh, Oh, like so you, uh, we are working. We're working on a on a. <coughs> we're working on CI integration, and right now the only CI that we have is Jenkins. But we could see something with Pagger doing CI integration with something like uh, OpenQ or Taskotron, and that, and then when you open a pull request, you get so pull requests can be flags, and you can get a flag a flag from RPM Lean saying you have three warnings or four errors. Well, there's also um, cost sharing. Or whatever, however you Yeah, or you can you could uh, you can integrate cachet because integration. Because the problem with, with CI yeah. is you need to rebuild everything that depends upon you to see if they broke as well. That's, that's where it gets very <laughs> interesting. So, yes. mm. uh, what do you uh, hardware? Tips. <laughs> Pay attention oh, a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, you, that's your baby. So, <laughs> I'm just going to try and do a lightning talk if I can figure out how to sign up for it. We're just I'm just trying to speed up. So mirroring we, a bit. We talked about mirror manager too. We talked about mirror list. Uh, but there is also the server side of it, and that's how mirrors report that they are up to date to us, yes. or if they want to. Uh, and that's quick Fedora mirrors, and that's tips, baby. And it's basically would make uh, running a Fedora mirror much quicker. Yes. Uh, both of them have been running the script for like every 10 minutes. Oh yeah. And that's how much. Uh, that's how little load. Six it, seconds if there's no changes. So. That, that's how little load it brings to both the servers and yeah. the host running it. Yeah. I need one. I need one. Oh yeah, it's from So I already talked about FMN, So that's one less to do. Uh, Wiki is getting upgraded. No, it's okay. Wiki that's is okay. getting up upgraded. Oh. It's moving to. It's going to move to OpenID. So you're going to have the, the same login page as for every oh, cool. other app. Uh, it's moving from MySQL, from MySQL to PostgreSQL. Mm -hmm. It's moving from Real Six to Real Seven, and. That's, there is a question of uh, will we get better mobile support with the new version? That's uh, something with the question mark we need to test. Yeah. Is it, uh, is it <laughs> going to change the version at all? Or? Okay. Yeah.
Okay, and we are past five minutes, but do you have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> So, MD API is Python 3 only. One of the latest services written by Orenia to do uh, to be able to do uh, plus plus outside Zotbot, outside IRC, to give uh, cookie badges oh. is Python 3 only. So we are towards slowly, but we are moving towards few of the our applications that are Python 3. Uh, one of the problem is getting the Python 3 stack in APL 7 yeah. to get decent support. Dockerization might actually help on that. Yeah. So something to see. You had a question, Isaac. I haven't learned a full lot of time about Beaker, so is there something that will be available in the future, or is it already forgotten? It's there. I don't know what the status is. Tim might have more of an answer. It is in the same place it has been, where the stuff is all there. It's just very dependent on my free not work time, <laughs> and there is not a lot of that. So that's the only thing that's really stopping it from working. We have the machine over there. We Um, it's just there's a few last integration things that need to happen that probably won't happen unless either someone sets their razors to annoy and it's <laughs> a regular basis. Um, and even then, it's, it's so it's dependent on my free time. Okay. So it's even progress. Yes. It's it's been in progress for a long time, but uh, yeah, it's it's a slow progress. <laughs> it's pushing things than it used to be. <laughs> Any, Any other questions? questions? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Thank you for coming. Thank you.